Today we will be discussing or we will start our discussion on string field theory. Uh, so last time we discussed that when we want to quantize a gauge theory having very complicated uh, gauge structure, we need to use uh, the BV formalism. Then we discussed how to construct or, or what is the essential idea of classical BV equation. And then we studied that when then, then we constructed a master action that satisfy a classical uh, BV master equation. Or we, we at least we argued that it is in or mentioned that it is it is possible to construct a classical BV master action uh, uh, from provided you, you you have a classical action. So that is guaranteed. Then we said that if you want to quantize the theory, you have to modify your action uh, uh, such that it satisfies a new equation. This is a quantum generalization of uh, classical BV equation. And uh, you have to solve the uh, quantum master equation and get the quantum uh, master action. And accordingly, you have to modify the notion of what you mean by physical observables in your theory. So that's what we discussed. Now we will discuss the construction of closed bosonic string field theory. So let me briefly mention some of the aspects of world sheet conformal field theory. A bosonic closed string theory. So the world sheet CFT has two sectors. One is the matter sector. It's a CFT having a ghost sector. The CFT having central charge minus and minus. So the full world sheet CFT has central charge equal to zero. So let us consider this, the CFT on a complex plane with, com, uh, uh, with coordinate Z. Now, uh, if you have a conformal field theory on this complex plane, then that theory should be invariant under the conformal transformation C going to F of C. And you can define a stress tensor for uh, world sheet CFT, or you should have a stress tensor. And then that transform under this conformation in a specific way. So it, you pick up some factors, and then you get, again, stress tensor after coordinate transformation. And then there's a factor or piece which is proportional to a constant, and this constant is a central charge, into a Schwarzschild derivative. Schwarzschild derivative is defined as f of, uh, f of c equal to del c f del c cube f minus 3 by 2 del c square f whole square divided by del c f square. So this is the transformation property of the stress tensor. And you have a special class of operators in your conformal field theory. Those are called the primary fields. So they have a specific transformation property. Say phi, is, phi c is a primary field. Then under this conformal transformation, phi c transforms to uh, uh, give you phi prime f of c equal to phi c into del uh, raised to minus h. So this is the way your primary field transforms. So you can see that central charge is the obstruction uh, 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 for the stress tensor being a primary field. So that's the most elementary feature of a conformal field theory. And then uh, you can easily write down the mode expansion for each field in your theory. So let's say you have a primary field having uh, dimension. This is, this is called the weight of the field, uh, 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 the primary field. So you can write down a modus phi n divided by c raised to n plus h. C 
Similarly, you can write down the mode expansion for the stress tensor is given by ln divided by c raised to n plus 2 n and then similarly you have for t bar c bar. And you can define a vacuum for this theory at, uh, your, uh, at the, uh, in the asymptotic past that's equivalent to having an operator identity at the center of the complex plane. And I denote the vacuum by 1 and then this vacuum has a property that all modes uh, with n greater than or equal to minus h plus n, h plus 1 uh, annihilate this, op, uh, this vacuum. And you can define a corresponding uh, vacuum at the future, and that's denoted as ket minus one, uh, ket one. That has the property that it's annihilated by phi n with n greater than or equal to h minus one. So this is your uh, vacuum at past, and this is the vacuum at the in the, in the future. Now, you can generalize this vacuum to have some momenta, and, and I denote that vacuum as 1p vacuum 1p. Uh, so this, this is the vacuum at the uh, future. So these are some basic things. And now the most important part of the conformal field theory that's important for uh, or that, that's more relevant for constructing string, uh, string field theory is the Gauss sector. So, you don't need to know uh, uh, the whole details of matter sector. So you can have a uh, uh, general matter sector. Now you have a fixed Gauss sector and the properties of Gauss sectors are important for constructing a string field theory. So let me describe some properties of the Gauss sector. So the, the Gauss sector consists of two kinds of fields. So these are the Gauss for the reparameterization symmetry that you have on the world sheet. So you have two kinds of fields, CC and BC, and, and the conjugates. CC is a primary field having dimension minus one zero, and C bar C has dimension uh, zero minus one. Similarly, BC has dimension minus two, uh, sorry, two zero, and this has dimension zero two. Now again, you can write down the mode expansion. C is equal to C n, C raised to n minus one. And B C has the mode expansion, B n, C raised to n plus two. And they satisfy the com uh, anti-commutator, B n, C m equal to delta m plus n, zero. Now you have, you can introduce the notion of a Gauss number. So let's say you have a state, and then, then you can define a Gauss number of that state as the eigenvalue of the following operator. So you have a Gauss oper operator that measure the Gauss number, and I denote that by G. So G equal to three plus half of C0, B0 minus B0, C0 plus a summation where n runs from uh, 1 to infinity with C minus n, Bn, B minus n, Cn, and then you have anti-holomorphic piece for this, these terms. So you can define the, uh, is the Gauss number for the vacuum as 0. 
Then, then based on that, you can uh, uh, find what are the ghost number for it, different excitations in, your, in, in, in strings, uh, or in the Hilbert space of string theory. Now let me define or, or denote the uh, stress tensor for matter sector as TMC. And the stress tensor for the go and T bar, G C bar. Now we said that we have a well sheet theory defined on a Riemann surface or on a complex plane. And you can find a lot of symmetries or, or uh, reparameterization symmetries are there. And that's the reparameterization symmetry is the gauge symmetry here. So you have to fix that gauge, gauge symmetry. And once you fix it, still you, you'll find a remaining piece. That's a BRST symmetry. And you can construct the BRST charge. And the BRST charge is given by Q equal to uh, TMC. So this is the uh, a stress tensor for the matter sector plus half of the stress tensor for the Gauss sector and then multiply it with C, the, the reparameterization goes CC and then integrate it over DC 2 pi i on a circle or on a uh, uh, closed curve plus the anti-holomorphic part. Now the Interesting or the important feature of this op operator is that when you compute the anti commutator with the Gauss field, anti Gauss field B, then that gives you stress tensor, the total stress tensor. So, similarly for anti holomorphic piece. Actually, this relation is, an, is, is very important. In fact, uh, uh, if you want to construct a string theory or a string field theory, you need to have, if you are following this, the, the kind of construction that I, I am planning to discuss, the most important feature is that you should have a BRST charge. And, and the BRST charge, this, this should have the property that when you take a commute, anti commutator with B, it, it should uh, give you back the stress tensor. And the important feature of this stress tensor or the total stress tensor is that that's the thing which generates reparameterization on your world sheet. And one can, uh, so this feature is very important. And that's the feature that you use if you want to con generalize your construction or, 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 or take this construction to things like uh, uh, topological string theory. So this is an important feature of this operator. So in, if you want to define a, uh, uh, a string field theory, even uh, it doesn't matter whether you think about open strings or closed strings. This feature is the thing which is important for the most important feature of whole, uh, the uh, of world sheet CFT that you require. And you don't need to know about whole other details. So that's the main feature of the or main objects that you need for constructing a quantum field theory for strings. I'm going to use the following normalization uh, for the inner product, and it's given by 1p, uh, the, the, inf uh, the vacuum at future, and then I have a set of operators, c minus 1, c minus 1 bar, c0 plus, c0 minus, uh, c1, c1 bar, 1p, it should be equal to 2 pi raised to d, where d is the dimension of the space time where I'm uh, uh, Studying string theory, p minus pre prime. Here, uh, e zero plus or minus equal to half plus or minus c c zero bar. So that's a, a basic features of world sheet CFT. Now you have to define uh, certain inner products in, in, in this world sheet CFT. So you can define a different, uh, at least 
two kinds of inner products. So one inner product is the anti -lead. Uh, inner product. So it's uh, uh, defined as, so let's say you have two states denoted by A and B. So you take I, I, I will define the anti-linear inner product between states A and B as the usual inner product of A and B with a difference that uh, you have to take the Hermitian conjugation of A. So now, so that's one thing. So this is a simple, uh, it's a definition for anti-linear inner product. And why I call this as anti-linear inner product? The reason is that if I change replace it uh, a alpha plus or a alpha, then what you get is the following. So you start with alpha a b, then this equal to alpha star a b. So alpha doesn't come just like that. You have to take a complex conjugation of alpha. So that's why it's called anti-linear inner product. So if you have an operator O multiplied with A and then take the anti-linear inner product with B, then this is equal to, uh, this is equivalent to taking inner product between A and O dagger B. So that comes from the basic definition. So now other important inner product is the BPC inner, pro uh, BPC inner product. So there the only difference is that we don't take the Hermitian conjugation. So what you do is you just take a state A and B and take the inner product between A and B with a C0 minus uh, in between. So that's, these are the two inner products which are important or useful for our uh, construction. So, so you, if you are given all these data, you can ask what is the, uh, com you, you can find a complete uh, uh, set of states which act as a basis for uh, this Hilbert space for the world sheet CFT. And le let me denote uh, a basis as phi r and then r runs from or uh, 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 zero to infinity or whatever possible values that, that you Why can have. Yeah. I mean the point is that it's, with this notation it's the the expression for kinetic time in string field theory has a simple, I mean, you can use any, any of this inner product by appropriately, appropriately modifying. Uh, I think this is what usually appears in the kinetic name for the string field theory. So you, you see, you have a, a BPC conjugate of a state A uh, that you obtain the BPC conjugate by just, uh, just taking the operator A inserted at C to, to position one by C. So it's like past and future. So you, you, so you want the specific ghost number for the whole uh, correlation function. So that's the that's only thing. So I mean, there is not, no big physics here. There's just certain uh, definitions. Yeah, these are the convention. So you can define a basis for the Hilbert space of world sheet CFT. And this consists of all the states 
that comes from matter sector, Gauss sector, and also from the uh, uh, component piece. Now you can define a set of conjugate states, phi c, r, and the property is that if I take f state phi r, and then take an inner product with, with phi z r, you should get, say, uh, delta r's. So these are, so the state phi s or the state phi r c is conjugate to the state phi r. So this is the conjugate basis. Now given that, you can write down a complete uh, a completeness relation. So you have to define this in the product with the line in between, right? What is it supposed to be in this CFT? What is the operation in CFT? Uh, with line? Um, the right hand side of this thing. So this one? Yeah, what, what does that mean in the CFT? What are you doing? I mean, it's just the usual inner product between two states, right? So in other words, it's equal to saying that you take a uh, operator and then place it at C, and then take an operator B, B, C, and then place it at one by C, and then just compute the correlation function between them. Is, 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 is that what that means? Exactly. Is this the line? Right. So this one. This just means that. So take phi years and then place it at uh, one by C. So in other words, you place your operator at zero and then the other operator at infinity. So now let's start to uh, start discussing string field theory. So these are the basic conventions that, that we are going to use. So the first step is to define what is what are the degrees of freedom in string field theory. So we will introduce the notion of string fields. So the, an arbitrary string field, so, so this is an arbitrary string field. So an arbitrary string field is just a sum of all possible states that you can have in the uh, Hilbert space of world sheet CFT. So let's denote a string field by psi, and that can, that can be expressed as a sum of basis states for the world sheet Hilbert space. So you have phi s as your basis states, and then multiply with a coefficient psi s is a small psi, so it's a capital psi, and then sum s from, uh, uh, sum s over all uh, uh, basis, basis uh, elements in your uh, Hilbert space. And the coefficient is a function of space-time variables, and this coefficient is what you call as what you call as a target target space field. So these are the kind of fields that you usually see in quantum field theory. So say this is some graviton or, or a photon, and this is the thing which comes from the world sheet Hilbert space. So the coefficient is what you call as target space field. And these are the things which are functions of space-time variables. So it depends on time and then your space-time coordinates. Now this is an arbitrary string field. Now the, an arbitrary string field is not what actually enters into the construction of uh, the action for string field theory. So the, the string fields that enters into the construction of action for string field theory are, are called as dynamical string fields. A dynamical string field has a certain properties. So the property is the following. So it should be annihilated by the operator B0 minus B0 bar. And also it should be annihilated by the operator 
L0 minus L0 bar. So if your string field satisfies these two conditions, then you say that uh, you, have an, uh, you have a dynamical string field. And, and there are certain string fields that act as gauge parameter for, for, or, or gauge uh, uh, parameter for the gauge transformation in your string uh, that, that you apply on a string field. So I will descri describe in detail what is the gauge transformation that you can apply on a string field. But I will just introduce another set of string fields that, that, is, that will be used for doing the gauge transformation. So this is denoted by omega. And this one, right? Yeah. yeah, but the dimension, yeah, that's true. So in, for an arbitrary string field, that, that's what you see. In general, you can have the uh, same number of uh, uh, space time or target, string as target space fields, uh, same as that of the uh, number of uh, dimension for the uh, Hilbert well sheet, uh, uh, CFT Hilbert space. But you should remember that there is a huge Hilbert space. So it contains infinite number of states. Not all states. Are, are the states that you see in usual string perturbation theory. In string perturbation theory, we demand that you will consider only those states having specific Gauss number. So they should have Gauss number two. So, but when you construct an arbitrary string field, you, you include all possible Gauss numbers. It can have Gauss number zero, it can have Gauss number two or whatever is possible. So the, the full Hilbert space of world C, CFT is much bigger than the usual uh, Hilbert space that you see in string perturbation theory. So, and you have to use the full Hilbert space for constructing uh, an, an arbitrary string field. So now, uh, uh, let me introduce another string field, uh, which I denote by gamma, uh, or what is called, this is omega, right? Lambda. Oh, lambda, so not, nothing. <laughs> so okay, so this lambda should also satisfy these conditions. Now, when you construct a classical string field theory, uh, the Gauss number for a string field should be a specific number. That should be two. And, and at classical level, the gauge parameter should have Gauss number one. And, and you can have arbitrary rationality for each state in your string field. Now you can define a, a Gauss number for, or you can figure out what is the Gauss, Gauss number for the string field. So what you should do is, you take your string field, psi, and then act with our Gauss uh, number operator, g, and that will tell you what is the Gauss number. So the thing is that you, you have to just neglect the coefficient, psi, yes, and then just act on the state coming from the well sheet Hilbert space. That will tell you what are the uh, 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 Gauss number, Gauss numbers for each components in the string field. Now this coefficient can be a complex uh, uh, variable. And you know, and, and usually when, when you construct a target space field theory, we, we don't, I mean, say, let's say if you are interested in looking at a tachyon, the tachyon field is real. So the basic thing is that you have to allow, or you have to impose a reality condition on the string field if you want to have a Hermitian action. The reality condition that I use is this. So you take your string field and then apply a Hermitian conjugation that should be equal to the minus of uh, BPC conjugate of state psi. So this is a reality condition that we will be using. So to give you a better feel of what, what is a string field, let me write down a tachyon field that is represented as a string field. The tachyon field is represented by the uh, uh, by T and that's given by uh, consider the vacuum 1p and then act on it with 
operator C1, C1 bar, and then you have your target space field phi p, and then integrate it over all possible momenta. So this is your tar tachyon field. Now once you take the Hermitian conjugate, this is equal to dp 2 pi d phi star p 1 p c1 uh, c minus 1. And the reality condition that we implement here looks like following on the uh, 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 for the field phi p. So you take your field phi p and then do the complex conjugation that's equal to phi minus p. So this is the reality condition for the tachyon field. So, so I just wanted to show you this to give you a feeling of what, what is a string field. So string field is just those things that you see in string perturbation theory and then just multiply with a function and then sum over all possible such configurations. And these functions that, that we multiply with the Hilbert space states are the fields that, that appear in the final uh, string field theory. So what one should remember is that a string field theory is a usual, uh, it's just like a usual quantum field theory having usual fields, but the way you construct it is slightly different. You, you rely on a well sheet conformal field theory for constructing, the, uh, uh, constructing this complicated quantum field, quantum field theory. So once you have all these definitions, you can write down what is the kinetic term or classical kinetic term for string field theory. The kinetic term is given by an inner product between string field psi with a uh, uh, operator C, C0 minus, and then your BRST operator Q. So this is your kinetic term, classical kinetic term. Here, the condition is that the Gauss number of string field should be two. And you can see that this has ghost number two and this has ghost number two and this piece also have ghost number two. So the total thing has ghost number six. That's what you require for getting a non-zero uh, uh, correlation function on, on a sphere. So this is a sensible object. And this is the classical kinetic term. Now once you have a kinetic term, you can write, you can figure out what is the field equation. So in terms of uh, the inner product that we introduce, this looks like minus half psi uh, C0 psi. This is the antilinear inner product. If you are using a BPC inner product, this is just C Q psi. So now you can take your classical uh, kinetic term, and then write down what is the equation of motion. So you can vary the uh, functional of string fields, so this action, and then set it equal to zero. And that gives you the following equation of motion. So you take your string field, act with the BRST operator, and the classical string field should be annihilated by the BRST operator. And this is the kind of condition that you see in string perturbation theory. So what you can see is that at least uh, at the leading level, string field theory is reproducing string perturbation theory, or at least a spectrum of string perturbation theory. And this has a gauge invariance. So the solutions of uh, 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 these equations are the classical field configuration, but all of the field, all such solutions are not independent. Some of the configurations can be related to each other uh, by a Gauge, in, uh, gauge transformation Q lambda. And this lambda was the lambda that we were discussing here. So one should remember that this string field psi should be annihilated by B0 minus B, uh, uh, B0 bar and L0 minus L0 bar. So the point is that uh, 
the physical Hilbert space or physical spectrum is not precisely the cohomology of the operator Q. It, you have to add few more conditions. So these conditions are important. You take, you, you solve your uh, 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 field equation and then put additional constraints on the top of gauge invariance. So it's not the cohomology of the BRST operator. So these, uh, so let me uh, uh, write down the form of this string field uh, kinetic time for a tachyon field. For tachyon, the kinetic time looks like, so you can work out and see that it's just minus half dp 2 pi d phi minus p, p square minus 2 phi p. So this is the simple uh, uh, kinetic term that you usually see in a usual quantum field theory. So far, we were just discussing a classical, uh, a classical kinetic term for a string field theory. Now we have to construct what is the classical kinetic term that satisfy classical master equation. Uh, mm -hmm. study the I, I just to tell you, like, or just to show you, string field theory is not really very different. So the, it, it looks like you have a different kind of uh, uh, quantum field theory, but at the end you reproduce the usual uh, uh, quantum field theory that you see. So I just wanted to demonstrate. So if you want to consider more complicated uh, uh, string field, you can introduce all other massless uh, uh, states, or, or you can even include massive states. And at the end, what you see is you will reproduce an action that you usually see. So I just wanted to convey that idea. So if, or, or in other words, if you consider string, uh, instead of tachyon field, if you consider a graviton field, then you will see that at the end you can uh, reproduce the uh, uh, kinetic term that you see in general relativity. So let me uh, uh, discuss what is the, uh, mass, uh, uh, the BV analog of classical kinetic term that we have. That means we have to uh, identify the field and anti-field. So we just discussed what is the field in your uh, theory, right? So by field, I am uh, referring to the target space field. So we identified what are the target space field. Now we want to identify what are the target space and the fields. So in, it's in, 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 in string field theory, that, that it's very easy to introduce them. So the, the thing that you do is you take a dynamical string field and then split into two pieces. So you have two pieces, psi minus and psi plus. And the claim is that this piece will contain all the fields in the, from the point of view of target space, and this will contain all the anti fields. So, so here, remember that we had a constraint that the Gauss number for the string field, or the com all component string field should have Gauss number two. And, and now I'm going to relax that. I can have more general field, uh, 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 string fields that contains uh, components that have ghost, ghost number other than two. So here I, should, I, I forgot to introduce uh, one more notion. So he, we, we saw that we have the usual notion of ghost number. Now we have to introduce a ghost number for the target space field. So before discussing and D fields, let me introduce that. A ghost number for target space fields. So let's say you have a particular component in your string field given by a state phi s multiplied with the uh, uh, a coefficient psi s. We have a, you, you, we know the usual notion of, go, uh, we can easily compute the Gauss number for the state phi s, and then we are going to introduce another kind of Gauss number for the target space field. And the definition is as follows. 
So let me denote the Gauss number for the target space field as G star psi s. And I define the Gauss number as 2 minus G s, where G s is the eigenvalue of the operator G after acting uh, uh, on the state phi s. So this is the definition of a Gauss number for the target space field. Now why, I, why, why should we introduce a Gauss number for a target space field? The reason is that if you remember, when we follow the BV formalism, we start by identifying fields and then, identify, then, then we introduce a notion of targets, uh, notion of Gauss number. So we assign a Gauss number to each field. And then we identify anti fields satisfying or having a specific Gauss number, right? So let's say we had a field, psi s, and then that has Gauss number, gt psi s. And then we identify a Gauss, uh, and, and the field for the field psi s by demanding that the Gauss number for the and the field, which I, let me denote it by psi star s, it should be minus of the Gauss number for uh, Minus one. So we need to introduce a notion of notion for notion of Gauss number for target space field. The way we do is by using the uh, Gauss number that we have for the world sheet CFT. So once you have that, you can identify fields and anti fields in your uh, uh, in string fields. So take a string field having arbitrary go, uh, components having arbitrary Gauss numbers, and then we can split that into two. And so you have one piece, which I denote by psi minus, and psi minus can be expanded as follows. So you take your basis for the Hilbert space. So this is phi s, and then multiply with the coefficient psi s, and then we sum over all uh, basis states having Gauss number greater than or equal to 2, or less than or equal to 2, with a prime in the sum. So you sum over all states having Gauss number less than or equal to 2. That's equivalent to saying that the target space field should have Gauss number greater than or equal to 0. And then we put a prime here. So to, just to remember that, we are not supposed to sum over all basis states. Only those basis states that satisfy these conditions. So we can identify, so I claim that these are the fields. So basically these are fields, uh, target space fields, having target space Gauss number greater than or equal to zero. So that's the fields in your theory. Now what is psi plus? To be positive. positive. Yeah. That's minus. Uh, that's why two minus g s, right? Right. Uh, is it fine? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So here I defined go target space field Gauss number as two minus g s, right? So here uh, uh, I'm summing over all Gauss numbers having value less than or equal to 2. So if I place it here, so the Gauss number for this one should be greater than or equal to 0. But you call psi minus. Uh, so the whole thing I call a psi minus. I just, you could call a psi plus. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, this is how Barton denoted. <laughs> so you can shift it, that's fine. I mean, I think from the target space field point of view, it's sensible to call them as psi plus. But when you denote it, so you, you mostly uh, refer to the world sheet CFT aspects, right? So in that sense, 
it's it's sensible to say that these are Gauss, uh, the part that contains negative Gauss numbers. So here you you will only have positive Gauss numbers. And for psi plus, you have sum over. You you have a similar summation, but the basis states that we are using is a slightly different. It's phi c phi s tilde multiplied with psi star s, and then you have a prime in the summation, and the summation is over all g phi s having a uh, Gauss number less than or equal to two. Here I should mention what is the connection between phi s and phi tilde s. Uh, phi tilde s is related to phi s in the following way. This equals to b0 minus into phi s c. So, so you take phi s, state phi s, and then find its conjugate state, and then multiply that with b0 minus. That's what you uh, denote by phi tilde s. So if the field uh, uh, phi s has negative or uh, Gauss number less than or equal to 2, that's equal to saying that this field has Gauss number greater than or equal to 2. Or greater than or equal to, yeah, greater than or equal to 2. Not equal to greater than 2, right. Because P0 will uh, provide additional Gauss number. So the point is that all the ND fields will have target space Gauss number less than zero. So the target space fields having Gauss number less than zero are, are the ND fields, and the target space fields having Gauss number greater than uh, uh, zero are the fields in your theory. So this way you can identify field and ND field. Now from this collection, what you have to do is, you just start with the field psi s, and then just compute its Gauss number, you will get some number. And then you identify an anti field for this field psi s by demanding that the Gauss number for the anti field should be equal to minus of the Gauss number for the field psi s minus 1. So you can find an anti field for each field. So this is guaranteed. So the point is that if you want to introduce a fields and anti fields, it's, it's, it's a simple thing in string field theory. You just Usually in your basis, you don't sum over all the size and the conjugate size. You're saying that the original size. So that's basically you are taking a, doing a doubling of the degrees of freedom, right? That's what you do in uh, 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 PV quantization, right? So you take collect all your fields, including ghost fields. So here you will have all the. Uh, Gauss field also in this summation. So no, it's not just the physical field. So you have physical fields, Gauss field, every single thing is here. Uh, so you call them as uh, uh, your fields in your formalism. Right? And then you, you double the degrees of freedom or double the number of fields by saying that for each field, each element in the set, uh, set of fields, you introduce an anti field. So that's what you do, do here, right? So you take uh, uh, the basis states and then its conjugate basis states. So, so if I look at the uh, open string, yeah. Uh, say if you had, so what would be the vertex operator for the ghost for the gauge field, for instance, in the open case? What would it be? I mean, this, uh, so it's just the same thing that you have in string perturbation theory. There is no difference. At the end, world field calculation ha has to be done in the same way. There's no difference. So what we are doing is we are simply constructing an action for a quantum field theory using the world sheet aspects. So you don't define a new notion of vertex operators. You have same vertex operators, same states. No, but if you just have the open string theory, I would just have gauge fields and tachyons. You don't have a ghost. No, you have infinite number of massive yes. sectors as well. Tachyons. Right. So you wouldn't see the space-time ghost as an operator in your theory. See, you, you have. See. That's what I was saying. When you look into string perturbation theory, you are imposing a specific condition on the string, uh, on the vertex operator, saying that the, the Gauss number for the vertex operator should be equal to one or two, depending on whether you are dealing with, uh, I mean. So you, you have a specific condition. So we relax that. So we say that you have all, all uh, different kinds of uh, world sheet states that have different Gauss numbers. 
So the point is that you don't have to deal with all those things in string perturbation theory due to the following reason. In string perturbation theory, you never look into internal channels. All the ghost will run only in the internal channel. On the external channel, or like at the external level, you won't see any ghost fields, right? So that's why you don't really worry about ghost fields. But if you want to really discuss about the degeneration of string, field ampl string, string perturbation theory amplitude, you can see that all those things will be there. And you, you have to use ward, ward identities to just show that all the contributions won't really matter. But they are there, and they, they are running in the internal uh, loops. But you don't have to see the, you don't study them at the, uh, at the level of spectrum. So, so the point is that you can introduce fields and anti fields in a simple way in string field theory, and then the kinetic term that satisfies the classical master equation is again have the same form. So it's just like this one, but the only thing is that we relax the ghost number condition. So here we should use string fields satisfying a specific or having a specific ghost number. Now what you say is that replace that with this generalized string field where you, you allow these kinds of ghost numbers, all possible ghost numbers. And one can show that if you just do that simple generalization, that uh, master action will satisfy the classical master equation. So that's a simple thing. I mean, you don't have to do any work. It's just that you just relax the condition on the string field. In other words, finding a solution for classical master equation is a very trivial thing in case, uh, for, for string field theory, at least at the kinetic time level. Now, uh, we ha we, we, it's not enough to just discuss the kinetic term. We have to discuss how to construct the interaction terms in string field theory. So let us uh, uh, introduce some objects to describe the uh, uh, interaction terms in closed string field theory. So it's convenient to introduce uh, a certain definitions or certain objects. So the thing that we are going to study is the algebraic structure of string field theory, closed string field theory. So let me introduce the notion of string product. So string product, which we denote using uh, a square bracket, uh, is, a, is an operation, operation that you perform at the uh, Hilbert space level. So you consider tensor product of uh, n number of Hilbert, world sheet Hilbert space, and then find an operation that map you to a single Hilbert space. So you take n string fields, and then find an operation that converts into a single string field. So let's say uh, uh, I have string fields b1 to bn. And when I compute, or when I insert the, that in, inside the string product, that gives you a state in a Hilbert space. So this belongs to a Hilbert space, a world sheet Hilbert space. So this is a string product. And this string product should since that's a, that's a state in a Hilbert space, and it should satisfy certain conditions. So again, this should be annihilated by B0 mi, uh, minus B0 bar. Similarly, it should be annihilated by L0 minus L0 bar. Since this is a state in the Hilbert space. Now this operation is multilinear. That simply means that if I introduce an alpha coefficient here, that just comes outside. And also, and that depends on the Grassmannality of the coefficient that you introduce.
say we replace the ith string field by b i b plus b i prime b prime to b n, then that's equal to uh, b1 to b i b n, uh, then b comes outside, then you have a sign factor that's minus 1 raised to the parity of uh, the, uh, the, the number b multiply with the sum of the parities of string fields b i 1 to b n. Similarly for the other term, b prime. Now when we swap to uh, a string field, again you have to worry about the Grassmannality. Say we have a string product running from b1 to bi, bi plus 1, and then ends at bn. So if I swap bi and bi plus 1, then that satisfies, or that picks a, a sign factor, minus 1 raised to the parity of, or the Grassmannality of bi multiplied with Grassmannality of bi plus 1 into bi or b1 to bi plus 1 bi up to bn. So this string product has this uh, uh, properties and on the top of it uh, a string product has to satisfy a, a condition. So it satisfies an identity and that identity is known as the fundamental identity. So before that, let me introduce another notation. So let's take a string product, and then I forgot to mention that there is a, a, a one more index here. So I have to add an index g. And later we'll see that this index g is related to the uh, ha number of handles that you have in the Riemann surface on which you com uh, do some computation to get uh, the definition of string product. So if you have a, if you're computing or, or finding a, defining a string product at, uh, on a sphere, and if you don't insert anything here, and then, so we just, demand, uh, we just introduce this notation that this is equal to the BR uh, uh, zero, and then, if you insert one single operator b at, uh, on sphere, then this is equal to or equivalent to acting b with the brst operator qb. These are notations. Now one can find the Gauss number for uh, a string product in terms of the Gauss numbers for the states that appear uh, inside the string product. So this is equal to 3 plus sum over i runs from 1 to n, Gauss number for the string field bi minus 2. Similarly, we can define what is the Grassmannality of a string product. So that's given by So just compute the Grassmannality of the field bi, then, some, uh, then sum it from 1 to n, then add uh, uh, 1 to it. So that's the Grassmannality of a string product. Now the most important feature of string product is that it satisfies, or we demand that it should satisfy a very important identity. So remember that here I am just introducing an operation and I have to construct that operation and I will do that later. So I am just saying that we have, we can construct an operator operation having uh, these properties and also that operation satisfy a certain identity and given that we have such operators and then I will introduce one more operation then you can define a string field theory action and then we can study its gauge invariances. And if you want to claim that you, you constructed a theory, then it's equal to saying that you constructed 
the string product explicitly. I mean, this is a definition. I'm just saying that right, this, this is equal to doing nothing, right? So you, you don't insert anything, right? So it, so you have a sphere partition, a sphere partition function that's equal to zero. Or, or, or I mean, I mean, at the end, this will uh, uh, this is related to that fact. Or at this level, you can see that this is a definition. Or this is just a notation that I'm introducing. And for the single insertion, that's equal to introducing a BRC charge. Now, now let us discuss the most important identity satisfied by the string product. So it says that a, a certain sum is equal to zero. So the first term in the sum is Q of the string product and then the second term uh, is a summation of B1 to QBI to BN. So you consider string product with a BRST insertion and then sum over all uh, uh, the different ways of inserting BRST operator then multiply with a sign factor so this is the second term and uh, i runs from 1 to n so it's equivalent to placing q at i th or, uh, i mean whether you are inserting at the first string field or, or whether you are inserting in front of the ith string field then the third term is given by even more complicated term where you have bi1 to bil then one term so you have you have a string product big string product where you have a state bi1 to bil and then the one uh, the last state is again a string product so bj1 running from uh, 1 to bjk so this string product has to be defined on G2 Riemann surface and the last product should be defined on a uh, Riemann surface having genus G1. And then mul multiply with a sign factor sigma IL JK. Then there's a summation over different genuses and then different ways of splitting. Uh, I want to IL and J want to JK. So what what are we doing here? So we start with the uh, a set one to n, and then we divide it into I want to IL and J want to JL. When you do the splitting, we'll pick some. We will uh, so we have to do certain ar rearrangements, and the sign factor that you pick after doing that uh, that rearrangement is denoted by this this piece th this term sigma i l j k. So you start with the set one to n, then divide it into i one to i l and j one to j l, and then you that's equal to doing certain rearrangements here, and that rearrangements introduce a sign factor, and that's the sigma, and then you have one more term. Uh, 1 by 2 minus 1. So again, you have a string product. This one remains. So here, uh, G, G2 plus G1 should be equal to G. Yeah, B1 to B, B1, B2 up to Bn. And then you should compute the string product on a genus G minus 1 Riemann surface. 
So what is actually happening here? So you start with a string product, which is defined at a GNSG Riemann surface, on a GNSG Riemann surface. And then when the BRST operator acts, so you get a term that's here. And then you have two pieces. So you can identify these two pieces as a certain degeneration of GNSG Riemann surface. So these are, so let's say you have a GNSG Riemann surface of, the, of this kind. Plus two Actually, yeah, that's true. It has n plus two entries. So you can see how it comes in the following way. So you start with a string amplitude having uh, n number of insertions with, uh, say, handles G. So, so you have a genus uh, G Riemann surface having n external puncture, n punctures. And what you are doing is you are just studying what are the different ways you can degenerate this Riemann surface. So you, you, what you can do is you can either split the Riemann surface into two. Right. So this vector is the one which actually, with at the end, you can use this vector to define a, 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 an amplitude. So this is a. Uh, string product or basically this is a state that you constructed by uh, taking product of n number of string fields or n number of vertex operators. Now you can take an inner product between a n plus one vertex operator and this vertex, the, the, this, this state, right? And that, that's actually a world sheet correlation function. That's the basic idea. So you use this string product to define the uh, object that looks like a string amplitude. So if I introduce this operator or this string product such that, I mean, a study is much easier. You can do things in an organized way. So you, you have a string product satisfying certain condition. So that's why I'm saying that this string product, uh, uh, so this string product has something to do with string uh, amplitude. Just remember that. So, so you have to associate a string product with a particular Riemann surface having genus G. And then different terms, so what you are basically doing it, doing from the point of your string amplitude is that you are just inserting a BRST operator and then computing that. So one of the insertions is BRST operator. So what happens? What happens is that uh, this BRST operator will just move around and then it will hit different states. So that's the first term. So you should think of this negative of this equal to this. And then, so, so that's the, uh, uh, the first possibility. So the BRST operator will go around and then hit on different uh, 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 vertex operators. And then what, what it happens is that, so it, it it will lead, lead to the degeneration of Riemann surface uh, into two pieces or into a single piece. So you, you, you have a possibility that your Riemann surface will split into two. One piece having uh, uh, a genus G1 and the other piece having genus G2 with certain number of external states. So when you do this degeneration, you are basically introducing a long propagator. So that's equivalent to placing a state on the first piece of the Riemann surface and another state in the second piece, second piece of the Riemann surface. So that's why at the end you have uh, you, you have uh, two string products. And the last thing can be or last term can be understood as uh, a self degeneration. So you have a degeneration where one of the cycle shrinks. So what happens is that the, num uh, the number of genuses for the Riemann surface reduces by one and the number of external states will introduce by two. So the essential idea that this identity captures is the following. So when you insert a BRST operator on a string amplitude, so this will lead it to degeneration. 
So essentially, this, con this contains the information about the gauge invariance of the amplitude. So that's why it's a very important identity. And you will see that this identity is what uh, 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 shows the gauge invariance of string field theory action that we construct. So this is the most important identity that, that we should remember. Or at the end, when we construct string products, we should make sure that that construction lead you to a string product that satisfies this identity. This is imposed, this is from the so here, we are, we are, I'm just imposing it, right. So, right. And then demanding that the Wolfsheet amplitude must be gauge invariant. So from the string field theory point of view, this is equal to a demand that the string field theory action that you're constructing must be gauge invariant. And that condition is equivalent to this condition. Or in other words, this condition comes from the BV master equation. It's basically the result of BV master equation, quantum BV master equation. That was the space time. Yeah, so basically here also, when you insert a Q operator, just the Q operator is related to the space-time gauge invariance, right? So here, uh, uh, the phi s and phi s tilde are related by, I mean, they, they so phi s tilde is, is constructed from the conjugate state for the uh, string field phi s. Now we, if you use this notations that we introduce, so basically when you take the string product for a genus zero surface with no insertion, we said that that's equal to zero. And when we insert a single operator or single string field for a string product that's defined for genus zero Riemann surface, we set that as equal to QB. So this notation can be used to write this identity in a simple way. So, so, so that will look, uh, a com that, that will be a more compact expression. So what you have is a sum over G1, uh, G2 such that the sum should be equal to G. And then, so we had a splitting of set 1 to n into I L uh, up to I1 to I L and J1 to J L, right? J K with all possible L K, the condition that L plus K should be equal to 1. And then we had a sign factor C I L J K multiplied with uh, a string product B I1 to B I L, then we had another string product B J1 to B J K. So these are the string products for the Riemann surface G2 and having genus G2 and Riemann surface having genus G1 plus half of S prime phi S phi s, phi s tilde b1 to bn. So here we include uh, uh, the possibility that g, one of the g can be uh, zero. Now, uh, when we construct string field theory, we, we assume that all these string fields are the dynamical string fields. So we can uh, uh, write down, so we say that the ith string field. Right, so that will come here. So the point is that you can think of Q of B1 to Bn on genus Gs. Bn. So that's why you, so you combine this term into this. Similarly, you can do it for do for the second term. So that's why you get a compact expression. So now, we, if you demand that b1 to b1 
Bn is equal to a uh, dynamical string field psi, then this has a, a even more simple expression. So this looks like uh, 0 equal to sum over g1 plus g2 to g L plus lk greater than or equal to 0 such that L plus k equal to n. And uh, you don't have to worry about different way of splitting it. Since you have n copies of say, psi, so that's equal to splitting n number of psi into uh, uh, two pieces with each piece having L number of size and K num uh, other piece having K number of size. So you have this combinatorial factor, N, by fa N factorial divided by uh, L factorial into K factorial. Then you insert L number of size, which I denote by denote as psi raised to L. And then you have K insertions of psi for genus G2 and genus G1 plus half S prime phi S so the big expression becomes a compact expression if you assume that all the string fields are identical and we need this equation so this is our main uh, input to get a string field theory. So we discussed what we what we mean by a, what are so we introduce an operator which is a string product operator, and then we 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 impose certain conditions on the string product. Now once you have a string product, you can define a function. So this is an operator, or this this will give you. Uh, uh, a state in the Hilbert space. Now we want to define an, a, a, a new operation that gives a number. So this is the multilinear string function. And this is denoted by uh, A b1 to bn again for a particular genus g and this is defined as an in, it's a bpc inner product between a and the string product b1 to bn defined on genus g Riemann surface. So you take the string product and then take an inner product with uh, 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 operator or, or, or field string field a. This can be understood as a certain world sheet correlation function. This is not a string amplitude, this is a correlation function. So, so, so correlation functions are numbers, so, so this is a function. And this object will also satisfy similar identity because string product will induce those identities on the uh, multilinear function. <coughs> so let me, so given that we can write down what is the string field theory action. So let us write down classical master string, string or classical master action for string field theory. So the action, classical action is denoted by Si and that's given by 1 by Gs square, then Gs raised to n divided by n factorial, take the multilinear function Si n for, uh, defined for a genus 0 uh, uh, Riemann surface and then sum uh, n from 2 to infinity. And this is your action, this is your classical action for closed string field theory. It's a simple looking equation. So you can see that when, you, when we introduce or, or remember the notation that we introduce such as this is equal to 0 and then you can identify that the first term in this 
action is exactly the classical master kinetic term and then the, the remaining pieces are interaction pieces. So this is a action having a kinetic term plus infinite number of interaction terms. And, and the action is defined in terms of this multilinear string function which was defined using the string product. So now we have to study the classical equation of motion and then the gauge invariance. So this is a classical action. So when you introduce genus, then it's, in, it's equivalent to introducing quantum effects, right? So you start introducing the loops. So here you don't uh, uh, worry about the loop. And, and, and that's an interesting feature of string field theory. When you construct the, I mean, this is same as uh, uh, quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, what you do is you have a, uh, a kinetic term plus all the interactions, right? So those are like a certain, a particular kind of scatterings, right? Uh, uh, elementary scattering of different states. So you can, uh, uh, so let's say you have phi cube theory, the elementary interaction is a cubic interaction, right? If you have five, phi q plus phi 4, so you have to introduce uh, one more interaction. So if you have all, uh, all other possible, I mean you can in principle add all other possible interactions. So the string filter is such an action that, satisfy, that has all, all possible uh, interactions even within the uh, 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 action itself. So if you remember, why should we introduce a different kinds of interaction term into your action? So at the end, what you want to do is, you want to reproduce your scattering amplitude or the, uh, uh, yeah, you have to reproduce the scattering amplitudes using uh, Feynman rules, right? So in string field theory, what, or, or even in, in string theory, if you want to construct a full scattering amplitude at genus zero level, so one can show that due to the certain properties of Riemann surface, it's, it's, it's essential, it's necessary to introduce all such interaction terms. Without having any, so if you remove one of the uh, interaction term from it, you won't be able to get a gauge invariant scattering amplitude. So in other words, if you remove one single interaction term from this action, then you won't, then the action won't satisfy BAB master equation. So it's essential to, or it's necessary to introduce all the interaction terms. And if you look into uh, uh, effective theory for string theory, basically supergravity at classical level, uh, you can see that this thing happens. So as you introduce more and more string effect, you have to introduce more and more interaction terms. All these higher derivative corrections, so, so you have that's basically equivalent to introducing all these extra interaction pieces. So the idea is that if you are able to compute these correlation functions or compute the multilinear function and then write down this action, say for low energy or, or, or yeah, then that reproduces the, uh, the gravity action. So this is, one should remember that uh, this involves all the different world sheet correlation functions, but at the end, they won't appear. What appears is a target space time field, right? So if you, if you do the calculation, at the end, this is just the usual gravity. You should be able to reproduce Einstein-Hilbert uh, action piece and every single thing uh, within this action. Just a nice way of obtaining all those space time action directly from world sheet. No. Yeah, nothing is on shell. This is uh, this is an off-shell statement. Also, I haven't gauge fixed it. I should correct it. So if you want to reproduce all the higher derivative correction, you have to actually find what is effective action corresponding to this action. So that one can do in a systematic way. So we found what is the action. And you can check that this action satisfies the BV master equation. Now let us study what is the field equation.
So you have to vary your action with respect to the string field and then bracket line. So you just uh, 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 recollect the definition of this anti bracket and then place this action inside it and one can show that if you use the main identity that we discussed, the, the fundamental identity, then uh, uh, it satisfies the V equation. So, or in other words, if you forget, if you forget about all the string products, you, you, you start with this action and then place it into the master equation, then you require that the multilinear function or the string product has to satisfy the fundamental identity that I discussed. So we can take this action and then vary with respect to the string field and then set that equal to 0. Okay, sure. Yeah. Right. So the point is that uh, that identity is satisfied at each genus level, right? So what I have to take do is I have to just consider that identity where I said g is equal to 0. Yeah, everything is equal to 0. Now, if I, I, I need that fundamental full identity in full form, if I want to show the, uh, 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 if I want to construct action at the quantum level. So let me, so let, we can uh, uh, take this action and vary the action with respect to the string field or class uh, uh, at the classical level and then you obtain the following field equation. Uh, f of psi equal to gs raised to n minus 1 n factorial n run from 1 to infinity psi n0. So this is a string product. So here gs is a string coupling. Right. Gauge invariance. In the action, you have all all possible interaction terms. So the point is that maybe you can ask: Is it possible to truncate this action into a, a, a field theory action? So you can do that by setting, by considering this limit, right? Then one can show that the the multilinear uh, uh, higher interactions are proportional to these pieces, so that you can neglect them. So now. Uh, we can get the field equation by uh, uh, by considering the variation of action with respect to string field and then you get an equation in terms of for the uh, 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 string product so if you want to get the classical configuration you have to solve the uh, uh, this classical equation and if i expand it this is equal to the following thing so you have so this one is equal to q or acting on the field string field psi plus all the additional terms so what you see is that if i assume that string coupling is very small or if i set gs to 0 then I reproduce the uh, original equation that we had in string perturbation theory. So that's equal to Q psi, that, that's given by Q psi equal to zero. So if I take it to string field theory level, or if I want to consider interacting strings, so the, the, the equation of motion will be corrected. So remember that in string perturbation theory, the Hilbert space that we study, or the, the spectrum that we study is for non-interacting strings. Once you start introducing interaction, basically you have to introduce a string coupling constant and then 
your field equations will be modified with these extra pieces. So at least this gives a confidence that string field theory will reproduce the string perturbation theory. It's because it reproduces a, a Hilbert, a, a, the, the physical spectrum for, for a, a free strings. And also it generalizes to the interacting strings at classical level. Now one can study a gauge invariance. So here we have to do a variation with respect to the gauge parameter lambda. And you can do the variation and then show that this is equal to the following sum. So if I do a gauge variation, I get this, uh, this contribution. And one can see that this is equal to 0 if I use the fundamental identity for g equal to 0. So, so you can see a similar piece here, right? So what do we do to get the delta S of delta S? So I take the following variation, psi going to psi plus uh, Yeah, actually, I didn't uh, write the variation properly. I didn't write the variation. So the so I have to take psi to psi plus delta comma psi, and uh, and sorry, I didn't write down it. This is equal to n equal to zero to infinity g s raised to n divided by n factorial psi n omega zero. So this is the gauge transformation. Now I apply this field uh, variation and then compute delta gamma s and I get this, this contribution. And this vanishes if I use the uh, fundamental identity. So I mean one can sit and verify all those things. So I'm just giving you a rough idea how things go. Right. You can, yeah, you can do that. So what you have to do is, you have to write down the expansion for the string field in terms of basis states, and then identify uh, the coefficients of basis states at, uh, in the left-hand side and right-hand side. So that will give you how fields transform. So for example, you can take a graviton field, target space field, and see what is a consequence of this relation. So that should reproduce the gauge invariance, or the gauge transformation that you usually have. So this one, you can again expand, basically q of psi plus another times. So if I, in, if I consider only a free string, so the gauge invariance is actually q of psi. Q of lambda. Oh, q of lambda. q of lambda. So we've, we, cons we, we wrote down the uh, string field theory action at classical level and then identified a gauge transformation and then checked it. we can check the gauge invariance using the fundamental identity that's satisfied by the string product. So once you have gauge transformation, then you can study the algebra of, uh, of that gauge transformation. So let us discuss the gauge algebra. Okay, I can stop it after. Or I can just stop it here. Uh, so the, maybe I can just write down the gauge algebra, and then sh show that this this is basically an open algebra. So 
So you can compute the commuted rate delta gamma 2, delta gamma 1. So let's consider two gauge variation with respect to the parameter gamma 1 and gamma 2 and compute its commutator. So you can show that after some algebraic manipulation, one can show that this is equal to delta gamma of psi. So this is a gauge parameter that depends on field plus L running from 0 to infinity, gs raised to L plus 2 divided by L factorial, psi L gamma 2 gamma 1, and then the equation of motion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Done. So what you can see is that you, you will see that you have gauge, gauge algebra which has structure constant depending on fields and, and an open algebra.